Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Becky. My name's Dave, and I'm an alcoholic still. Um, so the, the second hour, I hope everybody's had a nice lunch. The, the, the second hour, um, I'm basically going to ask myself questions and answer them. So, uh, you know, and the, the, the reason I'm going to do that is that when, when, I've, done, when I've done things like this before, uh, quite often when you have the question and answer thing, people get embarrassed to ask a question in a group, so they don't ask. Or what they do is they forget what question it is they want to ask and they just end up sharing experience because you're in AA mode. So they spend you know, five minutes or so sharing around the question without asking the question. So I think it can be most useful really if I just go through the, the common questions that I've been asked over the years that I've been a sponsor. And um, maybe that answers some of the questions that people aren't able to ask themselves. And then at the end of the hour, we'll uh, have a bit of hands in the air stuff. I know at the... Um, at the end of the day, there's going to be a half an hour window for people to share back. So I suppose in that sharing back time as well, if you want to, you can ask a question if you want to. Or, you know, tell us about the kind of stuff that you do uh, with people you work with. I, uh, so the first question I've written down is, uh, how will I know when I'm ready to be a sponsor? And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's an interesting question, that, right? Because I don't think um, I ever knew that when I was ready. You know, I certainly wasn't ready when I became one. I didn't feel like I was ready. Um, and, and probably even after three or four years of being a sponsor, I still didn't really think that I was doing it properly or that I was any good at it. Uh, and um, so I think if I'd have waited until I, I felt that I was ready, I would never have done it. Uh, I don't think I'd ever you know, felt secure enough where I was to have embarked upon that journey. So I think the reality is that most people, uh, certainly the people that I've worked with, embark on it um, where you are in recovery. And I think that, you know, like I alluded to earlier on, that, you know, for me it was about I was willing to help. I was prepared to put myself uh, in the situation where I could be of help. And as a result of that, I think that, you know, maybe the higher power comes into that relationship and enables me to help to the best that I can at that time. I think the other thing to remember is that I've never offered, I've never offered sponsorship to anybody. I've always waited for people to ask. So again, if you're somebody that you're thinking, am I ready to sponsor? If somebody's asked you, right, that's possibly a really strong indication that you are. Yeah? Because it's something about what you're doing, or the way that you are, or the things that you're saying, that has attracted somebody to come to you and ask what is often quite a difficult question. You know, the fear of rejection and kind of, you know, that kind of stuff that can be uh, around asking anything, anybody to do anything. You know, but specifically that. You know, will you be my sponsor? So it's a difficult thing to ask. I know in the early years of AA, um, it, it wasn't really optional to sponsor. You was expected to sponsor after you, immediately after you'd worked the steps. You know, and uh, people who worked the steps... Pretty much all the people that uh, got sober in the early years of AA worked the steps within a month of being sober. And so they were sponsoring people at a month sober, two months sober. When Ebby Thatcher went to 12-step Bill Wilson, he was two months sober at that time. So I don't think that a time period is necessarily indicative of whether your ability to sponsor or not. I know that in some sponsorship lives people talk about being two years sober before you become a sponsor. And I think that's uh, often unhelpful. You know, I understand why that is. You know, because if you if you are going down the line of sponsorship where you're going to be managing people's lives for them or offering them advice on how to manage their life, then possibly you're never going to be sober enough to do that. So two years is kind of an arbitrary time scale. But what happens at two years? I don't know. So it happened at two years that enables you then to become a sponsor that you you didn't have before. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So, you know, my, my suggestion would be is that if someone's asked you, right, whether you're a month sober, two months sober, or two years sober, that's possibly an indication that you're ready. Uh, and obviously there, you know, the fears around that 
are kind of then the things that you have to deal with, you know. But I found that the only way I learned how to be a sponsor was by being one. It's like riding a bike. You ride a bike through, you learn to ride a bike through riding a bike. Yeah. So, uh, there we go. That's the first question. Um, the second one I've got is, I can't seem to find anybody to help. And they look at me like that. I'm, I'm willing. I want to be a sponsor. But I can't find anyone. And so, the, the first thing I'll say to that question is, where are you looking? <laughs> What are you doing in, in your recovery? Are you going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous? Because to me that's a very obvious place to find alcoholics. <laughs> and if they say, well I'm going to one meeting a week, I say, well maybe there's a suggestion there. You know, that if you went to more meetings a week, maybe you'd come into contact with more alcoholics. Uh, what are you doing in meetings? You know, how, how are you, are you sharing? We'll say, well, no. Well then how, how will people know whether you've got anything that they might be attracted to? What are you, what are you transmitting to your fellows? You know, are you, are you saying to them, I'm somebody who's found a solution, I can offer help? Is that part of the things that you're communicating when you're sharing? Otherwise, how are people going to know? You know, if you're a newcomer, you're sat in a meeting and you're thinking, oh, I need to find one of these sponsor blokes, are you going to go up to a bloke who says nothing at all? Ever? Probably not. Yeah. Are you engaging with people in the fellowship? You know, that means are you talking to people before the meeting and after the meeting? Are you asking people how they are? Maybe exchanging phone numbers if that's appropriate. You know, are you engaging in them kind of personal relationship dynamics that maybe at some point will lead to a sponsorship relationship? Often the answer is, no, I'm not doing that. What I'm doing is I'm going to the meeting and I'm sitting there and I'm leaving. But I avoid talking to people because I find it difficult. So it's not that you can't find people. It's about what you're transmitting as an individual. Are you, are you offering that energy out for it to come back in? For that to come to you? I had uh, out for a curry with a mate of mine a while ago and he's been sober a long time and uh, he uh, was just talking in a general you know about our current experiences in, in recovery and where we are with steps and things like that and uh, it was good you know he was having a nice time and he was saying oh, he said, I just don't seem to be getting asked at all at the moment to sponsor anyone I said oh really you know so why, why do you think that is and he said uh, he said well it's just uh, where, I, where, where I am in recovery, it's uh, maybe I've kind of moved beyond where the newcomer is. You know. I said, okay. What makes you say that? He said, well, because I'm not getting asked at all. I said, how many meetings are you going to? I well, only going to a couple of weeks. So that's not unusual. And what do you do? Do you talk to the newcomer? He said, well, no, not really. Not, not really. And he said, the, he said, the reason why I don't is that I work, he, he works in a treatment centre, you see. So I work in a treatment centre and I'm with them all day long. So I don't really want to do that. In the evening. And I said, oh, right, okay. So what you're saying is you don't really want to do it. <laughs> he said, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, sometimes we kid ourselves, you know. You can say to the sponsor, you know, aspects of the ego for pride and whatever. We'll say, yeah, of course I'm willing to do this. But deep down inside you know that you're not. That's only something that you can address yourself. You know, nobody can make you be a sponsor. Nobody can say to you that you have to do it. You know, AA suggests it. I think our 12 step indicates it's an obligation if you want to experience AA to its fullest. But nobody can make you. So it's about that desire. Are you willing to take a chance? Yeah. Are you willing to surrender some of your time? Are you willing to work through the fears about maybe not being quite good enough as a sponsor and not really knowing exactly what to do and kind of stuff like that? Like everybody else has had to. You know, there's not, so I'm no, no different. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't come in, take a tablet and become an automatic sponsor. Automatic sponsoring device. You know, it's trial and error, working with people, doing the best that you can as you go along. 
So my experience with that question is that whenever I hear it, I know it isn't the truth. Because yeah, I think the way, the way the universe works, certainly in a spiritual sense, is that if you really want to do that, and you offer that out, it will come back into your life. And often as a, a starting point that I offer to people who kind of, kind of find themselves with that block of thinking that they can't find people, I just suggest to them, put it in your prayers in the morning. If you're on your knees in the morning, say to your higher power, please God bring somebody into my life that I can help. I'll tell you what you will. Absolutely guarantee it. Okay. Third question. <laughs> can I sponsor people of the opposite sex? Well, the short answer is yes, you can. I think there's any any rules around that NAA. I suppose there are some caveats to think about you know, with that stuff. The uh, human beings are uh, designed uh, to be attracted to each other. If you're heterosexual, that would be to the opposite sex. If you're homosexual, that would be to the same sex. And if you spend long enough with people that are attractive to you, of the opposite sex, things can happen. Whether you intended them to happen, whether you wanted them to happen, they can. Because that's how attraction will develop. You spend time with somebody. So you have to ask yourself, if you're a man, and you're already in a relationship with somebody else, how would that person feel about you spending time with women on their own and listening to their deepest, darkest secrets? How does that feel? As a man with maybe long periods of recovery, if you're sitting with new women, because well, whether you like it or not, well, whether you like this idea or not, this is the truth, as a sponsor, you hold a position of power over the sponsee. Because they've come and asked you for help. They've asked you for help to give them help. They're looking up to you. Whether you like it or not, that's what happens. So if you're a man and you're sponsoring some young woman, things can happen. Your intentions might have been great. All of a sudden she's attracted to you. Then you're in trouble. Uh, so think about this stuff before you embark along that path. I sponsored five women um, in my time in recovery, and none for a long time. My wife's sitting there. You know, why would I be sponsoring women when I've got a wife who can do that? No need. There's no need for me to do that. There's no need for me to do that. See, the women that I have sponsored, there was uh, two of them were were gay. And so I didn't feel like, for me, that that was a problem. You know? So if you like that, the attraction thing wasn't a problem for them, because they're not attracted to me. Yeah? And they found it difficult to actually go to a woman. Because they were worried about what that would mean for their partner. Yeah. And the other three were people that I gave a start with the book. So the people that were in recovery, they were kind of wanting to sponsor other women, but didn't know how to do the book stuff in the way that I do it. In the way that's become commonplace in our fellowship, actually. You know, it's not common now for people to use the big book as a sponsorship tool, take people through the book. And so a few years ago, you know, I took three, uh, three separate women I took through the book so that then they could do that with other people. I had no ongoing relationship with them three women. It was just for that purpose. And like I say, now if I know there's no reason for me to do that. There's plenty of women around who can carry a message through the big book. Plenty. There's no reason for a man to do that. Quite often women will seek a man because they're afraid of the judgment of other women. Yeah. They don't want to sit down with another woman or have another woman come to their house in case they steal their boyfriend. Things like that. They also know that they can manipulate men. Yeah. You can speak to the women. They don't like you to know this, but they can. They can manipulate you. If you're a bit helpless and you carry heavy things for them. 
things like that. You know. So of course you can, if you choose to, sponsor people of the opposite sex. But consider it. Consider what that means. Yeah. There are no big I am's. There's no, you see, there's no, there's no burning emergency that if I don't sponsor someone that they're going to die. Right? I've not seen that. If I don't do it, someone else can. Understand? You know, so when that woman's sort of saying to you, I'm really desperate and you're the only one that can help me, you blokes. Just you've got a choice to make, haven't you? You can think, well, I am the big I am, and of course I am the only one that can help you. Or you can say, here's a number of a few women maybe you could ring. Or, I can come around and see you tomorrow night, and when you go, take a woman with you. Other ways to manage. And what you find is, is that when the women hook up together, and they get over that stuff, around the competitiveness and things like that, which is slightly different to the relationships that men have, I think. The generalisation is that they can really form proper, decent bonds with each other that they're never going to get with you if you sponsor them. Never. But each to their own. Question four. Can I sponsor someone who is on prescribed medication? Now, the AA position on this is that whether someone's on prescribed medication is an outside issue, and AA has no opinion on outside issues. And that is absolutely correct. You know, when I've been asked that question doing platform speaking and things like that in the past, that's generally the answer that I give. Well, more help today, I think, will be to think that, you know, what, why, why are some of these issues controversial in AA? Because yeah. although AA has no opinion, it's an outside issue. Unfortunately, a lot of people in AA do have an opinion about it. <laughs> Again, the short answer is, yes, you can sponsor people on prescribed medication. So why is it a problem if they are? In my opinion, is that it isn't a problem. And I think that some circles in AA think it is. And the idea is, is that if you're on prescribed medication, you're creating some kind of barrier between you and the potential finding of a higher power. But somehow the medication is going to block you from finding God. So there's no point in taking you through the steps. And then people will find ways to sidetrack that issue and rather than saying to you outright they're not going to take you through the steps, they say, I have no experience with that. I can't take you, I have no experience with prescribed medication so I can't take you through the steps. Which is a fudge. You know. What they're actually saying is I'm not going to take you through the steps because you're on prescribed medication. I don't think you can recover. And I'm not going to waste my time. That's what he's saying. But he can't say that. So that brings into controversy in AA. See, if the no experience defence was true, a white person would never sponsor a black person. So the white person's got no experience of being black, so why would they sponsor a black person? You wouldn't do it, would you? I support Crystal Palace. Right? Used to have poor opinion of people who supported Brighton and Millwall. <laughs> See? I've got no experience of supporting Millwall. So I could say, well, you support Millwall, I've got no experience with that. So I'm not going to sponsor you. See, the, the no experience defence is just a fudge. That's all. Right. You know. So why do people feel like they need to do that? And what is the issue? It's this idea that prescribed medication alters your mood. It's a narrow view. See, I've considered this over the years, where I am with this. What does it mean to me? And in my earlier recovery, I would sponsor people that were on prescribed medication as long as it wasn't benzodiazepine-based. That was my view. See, there's two pure positions. Either you sponsor everybody, regardless, or you sponsor nobody, that does anything or takes anything that is mood altering. So that second position means that if you're going to be honest about that, you sponsor nobody at all. Because right? the most mood altering things in society are non-prescribed medications. There's things like sugar, gambling, exercise, relationships. So you could argue that them things are significantly more mood altering than a lot of the prescribed medications that people take. 
So if you're going to be honest in your position and say you're not going to sponsor people with that mood or whatever, you don't sponsor any of them either. Anybody that eats sugar, anybody that drinks caffeinated drinks, anybody that's in a relationship that's using that relationship to change the way they feel, anybody that's having a bet on the donkeys, you with me? It's a fudge. So I used to sponsor people, other than if they were on benzodiazepines, because my belief was, was that benzodiazepines, the sedative effect of a benzo, would mean that they weren't taking in the information. And then God presented me with a man who'd been on the Razapan for ten years. And he said, will you be my sponsor? And I said, yes. And I took him through the program and he recovered. He eventually stopped using his medication because he, he realised that he could find different ways of doing stuff. He did that gradually over a period of time. See, but if I'd have said no to that man, where would have been his opportunity to recover? See, if you say no to a man that asks you on prescribed medication, are you really giving him a chance? Are you giving him the chance to find a higher power? And are you giving that higher power a chance to work in his life? See, because I don't know what the outcome's going to be for any of you. When everybody's asked me, I don't know what's going to happen to that man. Some of the people that I've worked with have gone on, recreated their lives, got married, had children, moved away, had wonderful lives. Some people have got drunk and died. But I don't know what's going to happen when we start. So I've gone down the path now, I sponsor everybody, regardless of what medication you're on. doesn't bother me, it's none of my business. And at any time in the future you want to go and address that with a doctor or whatever, that's entirely up to you. No pressure from me, it's your business, not mine. Some of the people I work with have been on prescribed medication for all of their recovery. Some have given up over certain periods of time. I was on prescribed medication the first time I went through the steps. It hasn't seemed to have impacted my ability to recover. I seem to be okay. But if a man had said to me, sorry son, can't do that with you, I don't know whether I could have come off them medications at that time. So I had no tools for living. I had none. After I'd worked the program, thousand tools for living, I had the ability to come off the medications. Different. See? So everybody needs to consider that, I think. You know, if you've got a rigid belief about that, challenge it in yourself. Ask you why you've got it. Ask yourself, why have you got that? Why have you got it? What is it about these medications that's so special? Some of them aren't mood altering at all, they're mood stabilising. See, some of these medications that people take for psychiatric conditions can be used for physical conditions. For a period of time in my life, I was on a drug called amitriptyline, which is a beta blocker, for anxiety. Some people take that for heart conditions. See, I know people that take uh, medications like carbamazepine or uh, sodium valproate, which are used in the treatment of epilepsy. Physical conditions. <coughs> Also uses mood stabilizers for people with bipolar disorder. See, these medications have different usages. You can't afford to have a narrow view about this. You're going to be messing with people's lives. Two pure positions, in my opinion. Sponsor everybody or nobody. Otherwise you're playing doctor. Moving on. I have a sponsee who keeps drinking, what can I do? <laughs> We're lining up a bit now. Uh, encourage him to drink is one really good answer, I think. Yeah. The book talks about that, doesn't it? If a man's not convinced, encourage him to go over to the bar room, try some control drinking. I think the answer to that isn't, isn't about what you can do. If you're doing the stuff that kind of is suggested in AA and that you're offering him a, a kind of a solution out of the big book and you're kind of willing to do that and you're, you're offering him some kind of suggestions around prayer and things, you, you're offering him that solution, there's probably not a lot you can change. The answer is about what he, he's going to do, isn't it? You know. I love, uh, there's one bloke I've read, uh, see I always start, we start with people at the beginning. See, my experience is a lot of people get drunk in the first few weeks. You know, and, and a lot of people in AA do get drunk. You're dealing with alcoholics. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's going to happen. 
And he comes back and he says, uh, yeah, I had a drink. Okay. That's alright, that's what you're meant to do. That's not an excuse. Let's have a look at that. So I'll get him to think about what it was the moment before he picked up that first drink. What was he thinking? What was he thinking? The moment before you picked up that first drink. And generally say, well, I don't really know. I was thinking maybe it'd be alright this time. I was just thinking, fuck it. I say, there you go. There's an example of that insane idea winning out at that moment. And I always start people back at the beginning. Just in case we miss something. Start back at the doctor's opinion. There's one bloke, I read the doctor's opinion moving 13 times. 13 times. On the 14th time, I said, maybe you should go and find someone else up. Something about us two ain't really working out. I think I'll give it a fair go. I'll never get bored reading that book. So you'll only not do that if you think it's boring for you. Yeah? That's what it is, you know. Well, I've read that with him, I don't want to do it again. I'm always careful. Just in case we miss something, we go, we start again at the beginning. And if he keeps drinking, keep trying. You know. There used to be like, uh, some of the rhetoric in AA would be around, um, when I got sober, around, uh, sort of being quite punitive with people that drank. You know, why did you do that? And he'd say, I don't know. And people's response to that would be, well, that's not really good enough. You know, you need to try harder up your meetings, things like that. And, you know, that might be true in some cases, I guess. But the reality is, if you understand what alcoholism is, well, if you under- really understand what powerlessness is, as described in chapters 2 and 3 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, any one of you could drink on any day. Because it's a momentary thing. I have respect for that. I don't have no judgment. Just offer him some concrete suggestions around how he might enable that not to happen in the future. My experience with working with people is, is that up until they get through them steps, it's a really, it's a really dodgy time. Really dodgy. You know, the book talks about, you know, the, uh, the freedom coming through the step 10 and 11 and 12 process, coming out the back of step 9. Spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And I guess we can we can surmise from that that until that happens, it's probably on risky ground. And which is why I'm not somebody that believes in taking too much time with working through the steps. You know, there used to be a, a culture in AA when I first got sober doing a step a year. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how that works. How do you work a step a year? I don't know. You'll be twelve years sober before you finish the steps. <laughs> Yeah. You know. Early members did it in a month. Most of the step work was done in a day. I think three months is probably an okay period of time. Most of the people I work with is about two or three months. Depends on how long it takes them to write the full step. Next question. Um, should I sack a sponsor who is not following suggestions? So I used to go to meetings and um, I'd hear things from people saying the, the sponsee wasn't following suggestions so I'd give him his P45. Oh, I thought, so that sounds good. You know, that sounds, sounds like the, you know, like the way forward. And that, you know, and I was working with this bloke and he, and he wasn't following suggestions, you know. Yeah, he really wasn't, you know. Not that I was giving him any good, decent suggestions, really, but the ones I was giving him, he weren't following. <laughs> you know, and I, but I quite liked him, do you know what I mean? He was all right, he was with mates, really. And, uh, you know, and we were in the car one day, we were driving around, and he was, he was going on and on. I said, I said well, well, did you do what I said? What the suggestions, you know, what I'll give you? And he said, no. Nah. I said, well, look, I'm going to have to let you go. That's what I said to him. <laughs> suggestions, there's no point, I'm going to have to let you go. He's <laughs> what? So, yeah, you know, all right, Dave. Yeah. 
and then I dropped him off and I'm driving home. I felt terrible. You know. I thought to myself, what's that about? Why am I feeling so bad about that? I've heard people saying that they do this kind of stuff and it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And I realised that the reason why I felt bad is because I'd made that decision for him. Yeah. When people ask me now if I'll be their sponsor, I'm their sponsor for as long as they want me to be their sponsor. He's the only bloke I've ever given notice to. Never done it again. And what I found is that people that don't want to do it just stop coming round. They don't ring you. They go their own way. I don't need to sack them. I don't need to make a point. Yeah. I have to make a point to them. Yeah. So often that stuff's about control, isn't it? You know, you're not doing what I'm telling you to do, so I'm going to end this and be in control. I'm disciplined with it. I say to people, look, I don't mind if you cancel an appointment with me, but I'm busy. You need to let me know in advance. I'll let them not turn up once, and I'll warn them. I'll say, look, if you do that again, we've got to fix up. My, my time is precious. There are other people that want to do this. And they respect that. If you're open with them about that, they understand. Things happen in life. Sometimes you can't make an appointment. You, know, you get held up at work, or there's things going on at home. Phone call. Just let me know. That's fine. So I don't sack people. A phrase I've heard a few times in meetings and stuff like that is that he became unsponsorable. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. You know he, he, became, he became unsponsorable. So I suggested he move on somewhere else. He became unsponsorable. Next question. Um... I have a sponsee who is acting out on other addictions. I've taken him through the steps, but it does not seem to work. Good. Good question. That's my experience with uh, other addictions. Is that um, I, I put down the drink. Oh, it's 24th, 1998. It's the last drink I had. And everything else has dripped away gradually over many years of recovery. I uh, had a tug from the Customs and Exercise about uh, two years sober. I was importing cigarettes illegally from Spain and selling them in the meetings. On his program. I knew it was an honest program. It worked steps. <laughs> See? People find this stuff in their own time. You know, I used to uh, compulsively spend money. It's changed the way that I felt. Love the credit card, mate. Oh, great, isn't it? Great, powerful thing, isn't it? To have a piece of plastic and get you anything you want. Yeah? Marvellous stuff. Well, it's like going bankrupt in recovery. Yeah. So when people say to me, uh, oh, I want some financial advice, I'll say, look, you're barking up the wrong tree here, son. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, bank, bank, bank in recovery. I ended up going to Debtors Anonymous. And uh, other 12 step fellowships, you see, can be useful. See, I've, I've worked the steps, remember, at this point. Yeah, I've worked the steps. I've worked twice or something, you know. The Debtors Anonymous got some identification. Yeah. Picked up some of their literature, which gave me useful, practical things I could do. About monitoring what I spend, recording what I spend. Empowering tools, you know. My wife hates my spreadsheet. But you know what? It stops me getting in debt. Yeah. Other areas, you know, smoking. You know, I have my tribulations with smoking in recovery. You know, after about five years, six years of sobriety, I'll put it down. After several failed attempts at stopping and stuff like that. And it just came because I came so sick of it. So sick of it, I reached a point where I had to surrender. Had to surrender. You know, sex and pornography and things like that before I was married. Huge problem for me. Massive problem. 
I'm ne never faithful to anyone. And if I was faithful to him, I was using pornography as well, instead. So that's not being faithful. Because I'm pretending all the time, trying to fix myself. I never went to SLA and stuff like that, but my current sponsor gave me some things to do around that. An extended inventory process that I had to go through. Generate enough awareness about myself, for me to be able to take that truth to my higher power and surrender. And become free from that. So if, he's, if your man that you're working with, your woman that you're working with is engaging in these other things that happen, you know, all these kind of, we call them secondary issues, don't we? Food and things like that. You know. Encourage them to seek other fellowships. You know. and just encourage them. Because you know, it's normal, actually. There's lots of people that are non-alcoholic, non-drug addict, non -drug addict engage in that kind of mood altering stuff. And the point where we will change is when it becomes either insufferable for us to continue to do it, or we become aware enough to be able to do it. It's my experience. You know, Myers tells a great story, doesn't he, about his thing with uh, uh, topless bars. And it just came a day where, you know, America had loads of topless bars, didn't they? And, in, in, and they, there came a day where he just couldn't even cross the threshold. He took a step in and he just felt freezing cold, took a step back out and he was alright. And it is like that. There comes a day where it shifts. You know, make use of the tools that are on offer. You know, maybe you don't want to go to 101 different fellowships, but literature's available for all fellowships. I find that knowledge is immensely empowering. Knowledge is often underrated in our fellowships. We talk a lot about experience, strength and hope. But it's knowledge that often will be the catalyst for change for me. Knowledge gives me understanding. With knowledge and understanding, I can change. I can surrender and change. None of my sponsees are staying sober. Am I doing anything wrong? <laughs> Possibly. You might be. You might not be. And again, that's part of the individual journey as a sponsor. It's the question. Ask that question. Right? Yeah, it's not. See, I think that asking open-ended questions of myself has been my, one of my greatest teachers in recovery. Just, just to question myself and sit with it, not provide an answer immediately. Just to ask, is it possible that there's something more I could be doing? And sit with that. See what comes. Just see. If they keep drinking, it's probably because they're an alcoholic. Controversial, I know. Yeah. Are you willing to help? Are you offering them a solution that's kind of grounded in this stuff? Not your, not your own opinions. Yeah. If you've given them some other version of recovery, then it could be your fault. All right? And you have to own that. See, if you're somebody that goes to meetings and says to blokes, just don't pick up the first drink one day at a time. If you're one of them people that do that, God bless you. But you could be responsible. People believing that they can do that, trying to do that, and failing. See, the true alcoholic, the real alcoholic as described in our book, he cannot rely on choosing not to drink. He might be able to for a period of time, but he can't rely on it. Because at some point, there'll come a, there'll come a moment of time but he'll have no effective mental defence against that first drink. He'll be unable to bring into his mind with sufficient force the memory of the suffering of even a week or a month ago. And he'll pick up a drink as that's the most natural thing in the world. Powerless. And if you're telling him that he isn't, then possibly you're causing him harm. Because if he's powerless and you're telling him, just don't do it, it's not really helping. So although, you know, I, I forgive myself, I don't know the people that I worked with forgave me for kind of not really knowing what I was doing when I was first a sponsor. You know, and I made amends for taking a lot of them early blokes back through to work later on, things like that. You know. I never said that to them. Yeah. I was always trying to offer them a spiritual solution. 
I didn't imply that they could just do it if they really tried hard. They could just not drink if they really tried hard. Do you hear that it means? Do you hear that? You'll have sponsors that will promote that. So it might well be their fault that people drink. I'm glad I don't have that on my conscience. I have a sponsee who is very demanding of my time. <laughs> <laughs> What can I do? And that's the bloke that you think, maybe the P45 comes in handy now. (laughs) (laughs) But like all things in recovery, it comes back to you. You've allowed him to do that. You've allowed that to occur. Some people want to see you every week, sit down and have a counselling session with you, that they don't have to pay for. Yeah? Which might be great for them, but I don't want to hear it. I haven't got time. Yeah, so I set my stall out at the beginning, and I tell them I don't offer that. <coughs> when you ask me for sponsorship, I do not offer counselling. What I offer is a journey through the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step recovery plan. You want to count, you can find somebody else. There are sponsors that offer that. You know, they like doing that. I mean, that's part of what they do. And that's up to them. Nothing to do with me. But I don't want to do that. And, and I learnt that through having people that wanted my time all the time. And because I'd never given them the boundary at the beginning, it was my fault. That I'd allowed that to happen. And some people are very good at it. Like they're very, very good at drawing you into their drama. It takes a lot of discipline as a sponsor, if you want to kind of keep your time. Yeah. I like watching football. I like, like things encroaching on that time. It takes a lot of discipline, you know, without being rude to people, to kind of enable them not to do that to you. So one of the things I've realised over the years that I've been sponsoring people, is quite often when they're new, they're just confused. Right? They just want to talk a lot. And if I thought it would help them to talk to me a lot, I'd facilitate that. But what I've realised is the best use of the time they have with me is to take them through the programme. That's what they've asked me for. And so sometimes they come around and they say, I've got this, this and this going on, and you can see they want to do, they want to explore all that stuff. You know. And I say, look, I know I know that that's difficult at the moment, but what we need to do is get through this work. Because I know that once they get through that work, they start to see a lot of that stuff differently anyway. A lot of the stuff that they think is a real problem but doesn't become a problem anymore. It's really not an issue. Yeah. The way that they see the world, the way they perceive things as difficult, the way that they see, see people as being difficult can change as a result of working these steps. I know that. They don't yet. Yeah. So I politely just redirect them all the time to what we're supposed to be doing. You know, I might have like a ten minute kind of catch up whilst we're making the tea. You know, then we sit down and we open the book. Discipline with it. I had one bloke who was a past master, sponsored him for a long time, and he'd come round on a like an excuse, you know, anything really. Or, or he'd, he'd have one opening sentence about how are you, you know, and then so you'd say, yeah, yeah I'm normal, right, I'm not too bad, and then he'd talk for an hour. <laughs> you know. Sometimes it's easier said than done, you know. But again, you have to manage them, that thing, them things. You know. And uh, in the end, if you don't facilitate that, they will go somewhere else. You know, or they change. You know. So uh, anybody's welcome at my house that I've ever worked with, or even those that I haven't. You know, if you're in real trouble, relationships gone tits up, lost your job, you know, serious illness, things like that. These stuff happens in life. I never feel like you can't come around and have a cup of tea and a bowl of ice cream with me, because you can. Right? But if you want to come around once or twice a week for an hour and tell me about your week and your resentments, bark out the wrong train.
So it's down to you. How do you set up the dynamic with people in the beginning? You know. Uh, next question. I have too many sponsees now who keep ringing me up for inventory. I have no time of my own. <coughs> question for those who may be in late recovery, been around a while, things like that. But it could be a problem, you know, we're talking uh, step 10 about sharing things immediately. Uh, talking step 11 about doing nightly reviews and things like that. Ongoing inventory processes. And quite naturally, when people are new, and they've gone through the program with a sponsor, they feel like that person knows them. That that person knows where they're coming from. And so that's the person that they need to share this stuff with. That's a normal thing to go through that. You know, I used to think like that. I need to share this stuff with somebody who knows the background. He needs to be my sponsor. He's the only man that knows everything. So that's the man I need to share it with. And as a sponsor, if you uh, facilitate that on an ongoing basis, eventually you'll end up in a situation where you have no time for yourself. Because you'll be taking ten phone calls every night from people wanting to share their day with you. Becomes unmanageable, doesn't it? So I always encourage people. You know, I accept that for a period of time they will be reliant on me. Yeah. But my job as a sponsor isn't for them to be reliant on me. That isn't what this is about. That's not what we're supposed to do. You see? What I'm supposed to do is show them how to find God. And when God shows up in their life, that's who they become reliant upon. Yeah? There can be a gradual eking away. Because whether you like it or not, if you sit down with somebody with a book and you go through that process with them and they tell you their whole life story and you're involved in their amends process and you're kind of helping them with all that stuff, they're going to be a bond, an attachment. And he's going to be a little bit dependent on you. Whether you like it or not, that's what's going to happen. And there are friends of mine in recovery who kind of stick to a traditional kind of AA route like it was in the early days. And they see that as soon as that bloke's through them steps, they sever. Send him on his way. Perfectly valid approach. But it's not what I do. Feels a bit harsh to me, that. You know, just to say that we've done this discreet piece of work, now you're on your way. And so I gradually eat them away. You know, I might listen to a few phone calls of inventory and things like that. And little by little, I'll just be suggesting to them about finding some people close to them that they can share with. We get in my sponsorship lines, we call it the immediately people. Find yourself a couple of immediately people. People that may be at the same stage as recovery as you, understand where you're at. People that maybe go to the groups that you go to. Or you can just have an agreement between the three of you, the four of you, or whatever it is, that when there's something going on, a burning resentment, that you can can be one of your people that you're in. And little by little, I teach them this stuff to move away from me. I teach them about becoming reliant upon the tools and the higher power, not on me. Yeah? And as a result of that, I don't have ten people ringing me up every night with their inventory. Yeah? If I'm still inviting that into my life, it's because in some way, shape or form, I want to be in control of their recovery. I understand that. I'm saying that I'm the person that understands you, and you, I'm the person that has to be wrong. And rather allowing them to become independent, I create dependency. My view on that is that isn't healthy for them, nor me. So I go down this other path. I've got about ten minutes left, I think, of this session. What time are we finishing this bit back? Quarter past. Okay, so we'll uh, maybe take a couple of questions from the floor if there's any. Ben. Um, I mean, I, I think there's, there's an obvious answer is that you, you shouldn't sponsor people who are taking drugs. If you're going to go down this road of sponsoring everybody, then that's not an option. So what I tend to do is I will sponsor them. 
and uh, at some point they realise that what they're doing doesn't suit and they leave or at some point they stop. Yeah, but what I do is if I start the process, the early chapters take a few weeks the way that I do it. So you're not kind of getting into the nitty and gritties and stuff like that until a few weeks down the road. And during that few week period either they drop out generally I find or they um, or they, they stop. You know, and I think that I will share in a general way about how this has been a clean program for me. And I don't think that if I'd continued to deliberately use stuff to change the way that I felt in that way, then I would have been able to recover. A lot of this stuff around mood altering is about intention. Yeah, so, prescribed medications, I don't have a problem. I sponsor anybody who's on medication, it's really not an issue. But, uh, for that person, in terms of what it means for them, will often depend upon their motives for taking it. So if you're, if you're an individual that is taking anything deliberately to change the way that you feel because you're unhappy with your current circumstances, well, that will be a barrier for your recovery. Well, it won't be a barrier for finding a higher power, but it will be a barrier for your recovery because you're not willing to address the here and now. Yeah. For somebody who's taking it because they believe it's treating something for them and they're taking it as a prescription and it's kind of like that. You know, it's the same behaviour, isn't it? In some respects, you're still taking the medication. But the effect for the individual is very different. Yeah? So for the a man who might be dependent upon heroin, for example, or a methadone script, you know, if he's if he's if he's on that because he's addict and he can't withdraw because he goes goes into a turkey and he can't quite cope with that and he needs to do something about that at some point probably. But he's probably not deliberately changing the way that he feels. You know, in the same way that somebody who may be been abstinent from heroin for a long period of time and goes out and gets a hit. Yeah. Because he's unhappy with his life and wants a hit. I think that's broadly where I am. I would sponsor people. I do sponsor people. Uh, but I'll make it quite clear that for me this has been a clean program. But uh, it's up to them. You know, and quite often I've found, you know, I've sponsored quite a few blokes who've been smoking marijuana, put marijuana maintenance in the rooms, haven't they? And, I mean, I didn't know this, but apparently AA is quite a good place to come to school marijuana. I didn't, I didn't know that. The, uh... <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they... Uh... Yeah, they, they go they go a different way generally. I, I mean, I don't know anyone. I, I, I don't think there's anybody that I've worked with. Um, you know, you're probably talking to a couple of hundred people really that I've sponsored over the years. You know, to certain varying degrees. Uh, I don't know anyone who's got through the work whilst using street drugs. They've either stopped at some point or they've bailed out. All right, Tino. Um, do you sponsor everybody who asks for problems? Do you ask people to wait after the same time, or do you just have a menu? You know, do you do a combination? Yeah, combination. I think the um, the, the reality of life, right, is that uh, I have other responsibilities and things. You know, uh, we've got four children. Um, I work full time. Um, I like watching football. You know, and I go to AA. You know, and uh, Life's about balance, isn't it? You know, and I have a, a certain amount of time I can give up to people to do that work with. And what happens when you can sort of do things like this, you know, so you're the speaker in AA and all that kind of stuff, you know, you get a lot of people that ask you. So you come, uh, almost like they become, see you as a solution, like if you're the, the sponsorship speaker in AA, then you must be the best sponsor, so I want you. you know, so I get asked a lot, you know, of people, and the reality is you can't take everybody. So I'll only work with a certain number of people at any one time. Currently, that's one person at a time, just because of the way my life situation is. Um, when when I was newly sober, I'd be sponsoring five, six, seven people in the book at the same time. No problem at all. You know, it depends on where you are with your life. I think, again, it's about this thing around intention. So if, if you deliberately make decisions to avoid an opportunity for surface based on selfish motives and needs, that's probably not going to help you in the long run. But if you're genuinely making decisions... Uh, based on your current life situation and what's best for all of them things in your life, then it's probably okay. Yeah. And at the end of the day, there's only uh, you can only be genuinely unselfish by accident. That's my experience. You know, if I um, we talk about uh, being unselfish in AA, don't we? You know, working with others and we kind of we're doing all that kind of stuff. But see, I know there's something in it for me. See, when I work with others, I know there's a deal in that for me. You know, it's about getting out of self and experiencing that in my life. Yeah, the flow of the spirit that comes back through giving. So I know I'm getting something out of it. So it's not entirely unselfish. I can only be unselfish by accident. So I'm driving, if walking down the road, somebody uh, pulls over in the car and says to me, Dave, can you give me directions to so-and-so? 
Oh, and I haven't planned that and I haven't expected it and I'll get a choice. <laughs> I can either give him my time, send him, give him some directions, or just say, I don't know, mate, and walk on. Yeah. So it's an unselfish act if I give him the time because I haven't planned it. See, anything we plan has a selfish aspect. <coughs> so don't give yourself a hard time if you're finding that, you know, you, for me it's been about learning that. At times I've had too many people and I've sold them short. Yeah, that's the truth of that. You know, if, you, if you've got too much going on in that area of your life with sponsorship, you'll give them a bit of a short deal. You know, because you're always thinking about the next bloke that's coming round, all the other priorities in your life that you need to manage and, and get done. You know, and at times I've probably had too few. You know, where I've had an over significance on going to the gym or something like that. You know, which is a really useful thing to do and going to the gym is really great and, you know, I enjoy going to the gym, but it's, uh, it's not my primary purpose. I think um, the, the reality is is that for a lot of people it's a struggle to get sober. I, um, you know, we can talk about being sober now, almost matter of fact, but the journey into becoming sober can be very, very difficult. You know, I had several detoxes at home, things like that, before I finally got to a point where I became sober. And um, so, as a sponsor or as a, a twelve-step person, you know, how do you manage that? Again, knowing your boundaries, you know, it used to be when I first got sober, a lot of the old timers would just um, tell people to stop. But I think that most people now, we have a general awareness that, that often that isn't a useful thing to do. It can be potentially dangerous. What I've done over the years is a number of different things. So there's been people that we've helped taper off. So you basically sit there with a bottle and you feed them alcohol. And decreasing amounts over periods of time until they're no longer taking alcohol. Uh, but you've got to have the time to be able to do that. You know? um, sometimes we've done that with people as a group. So there's been like three or four of us that have done that with one person. We just do it in shifts. Other things that we've done is that we've gone to the GP with people. So rather than them going on their own to the GP drunk and saying to the GP, I want a detox, and the GP's thinking, there's no way I'm giving you any tablets. You, know, you go and have a conversation with the GP yourself. You know, I guess because of my background, I'm able to do that maybe a little bit more effectively than, than, or confidently than some people can, you know. But um, I've many times sat with the GP and they're saying, well, we don't do prescription detoxes. I like explain to him, I say, look, someone's going to be with him all the time. He's not going to have access to the medication. We're going to administer that. And as soon as there's any signs of any difficulty, we will take him to the hospital or bring him here. And if he hears that, he's quite often, in my experience, he will write you the script. It's a five-day detox script. And then you can just administer that as it says on the prescription. You know, and again, we've done that with groups of people and things like that. And, uh, you know, uh, taking it in turns in shifts. You know, you get a few blokes around with some DVDs whilst a bloke's shaking, shaking the alcohol out of him in the corner, you know, things like that. And you can do that, and it's very rewarding stuff if you can do that. There's a degree of organisation you need to have and support from your fellowship. It's possible to do it on your own, but quite often, I know, I know your particular life circumstances means that you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, outside of that there's not much else you can do you know the uh, inpatient services are often over subscribed and things like that but you can show them how to access that and the other thing that I have done I did take one bloke um, I just took him to the a and &E. I said uh, you need to detox him they said we don't do that here I said well I'm leaving now he's yours they said we can't do that so that's what I'm going to do. I'm telling you what his condition is. He's an alcoholic. He's withdrawing from alcohol. And unless he gets some medication, he's going to have a seizure. See ya. But they have to treat. No choice. But you don't win many friends at the A&E for doing that. And I'd say that's really your last resort. Yeah. And normally they'll only keep him in for a night. Only for one night. So you probably have to go and pick him up the next day. But they discharge him with a prescription, which is what you want. Alright. I mean, I'm How'd you get a sponsor? There, there are a number of ways to get a sponsor. 
Um, all of them involve asking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the, uh, the, the, the general route is that uh, you'll hear somebody, you'll see somebody in the meeting and you think, I quite like what they've said, I quite like the cut of his jib, or you just might think he's got a nice beard, and say, well, actually, I'd, I'd like you to be my sponsor, Jeff, and uh, say things like that, couldn't you? So, you know, but it's the asking thing, really. The vast majority of people in AA and recovery will, 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 will want to help you. Part of the recovery program is that we give so that we can receive. So, you know, but the caveats of time and availability apply. So if somebody, so if you used to ask me today, I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, I'd say, actually, at the moment, I can't because of this, this, and this. And sometimes that rejection can be difficult. But just ask somebody else. And eventually you'll find somebody who say, brilliant, bring it on. Come on in, let's get some work done. Yeah? And it's great. Yeah? So that's, uh, there's a plan there. One more, let me finish. Any more? Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, do you think there's any benefit to change the sponsor who's been in recovery while you're in the same sponsor or while that you do? Is it a benefit to change it? Or is it an easy particular reason to change? Or is it just to change to get a fresh perspective? Would you take that person through the program again if that would be a good sponsor? Um, I think the short answer is yes. I always encourage people to seek a new experience. So, um, yeah, sometimes it might mean that you end up asking somebody and, and actually they've got very different views to you and you can't reconcile that and it hasn't really worked out, you know, when that happens, yeah. But um, I think, yeah, asking in and of itself is an act of humility. So, you know, what you're, what you're saying to yourself is that I'm prepared to have a new experience and learn more. You know, one of the things that my sponsorship line work with is a set-aside prayer. You know, God help me to set aside what I think I know about these steps, this program, and, and you, you know. I think that act of asking for a new teacher, new spiritual teacher, can uh, be indicative of that, really. So, um, it can be very dangerous when you've been around a while, and, uh, you know, other people start to think that you know a lot, and then you start to think yourself that maybe you know a lot, and so it can be really useful then to kind of take a step out of that and, and find a new experience. So I think the short answer is yes. Um, I certainly don't think that uh, there's anything to lose. And if you end up going back to the old sponsor, that old sponsor's probably going to be all right with that, eh? You know? So some of the blokes I've worked with over the years, you know, they get fired up from some speaker that they're here and they go and have an experience with that speaker, maybe go through the steps in a slightly different way or something like that. And maybe a few years down the line, give me a phone call again and say, where are we now? And see where I've moved on to and maybe there's some other stuff we can do together. You know, and that's the work in progress that we all are, eh? Everybody's shifting and changing, hopefully. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.